Hi, welcome to my channel, Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today is the third part of the video series on constrictive pericarditis and I'll be talking about the 2D echocardiographic evaluation of the same. So instead of the usual active recall questions that I ask in most of my videos, I thought I'll present this particular video in the form of a case study format. So we have a case of dyspnea on exertion. It was a 25-year-old male who had come to our hospital with functional class 3 NYHA dyspnea on exertion. So before coming to our hospital, this patient had gone to various other hospitals outside and this is one of the echo report that he had gotten initially. Now this echo report had an impression of IVC dilatation, there was dilated RA and RV chambers, there was paradoxical septal motion, mild TR, mild PAH and RV dysfunction and the left side was normal. So when you look at this report, you kind of think that okay, this young man could be having pulmonary embolism and so he was advised to undergo a CT pulmonary angio. He, however, decided not to get a CT pulmonary angio done and instead went to another doctor wherein another 2D echocardiogram was taken. And this is quite an elaborate uh, report which says that the left ventricular lateral wall is hypokinetic which points to a circumflex artery lesion. And the RV is also showing severe hypokinesia, which points to an RCA territory. And there was also reduced LV global longitudinal strain with lateral segments which were affected more. Here in this report, there was no pH, but the IVC was again dilated and non-collapsing. The pictures are not very clear. However, this bullseye uh, picture of the LV strain does show that the lateral segments are affected than the rest of the segments. So finally, outside, he underwent a host of investigations, which included a coronary angiography because there was a suspicion of coronary artery disease. Remember the circumflex and RCA lesions, which was not surprisingly found to be normal. An HRCT chest was done, not a CT pulmonary angio, but nonetheless, the lung parenchyma was normal. There was some right-sided mild pleural effusion and the pulmonary artery had a normal size. So the patient finally came to us and we got another echocardiogram done and this is the first clip of the same. This is the parasternal long axis view in which this chamber is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle, this is the aorta, the mitral valve, the aortic valve the interventricular septum and the right ventricle. So as you can see, I've shown this clip before in one of my videos on constriction. There is thickening of the pericardium around both the inferolateral wall of the LV as well as that around the RV. And there's some mild amount of pericardial effusion as well. Also, when you look at it, uh, the interventricular septum seems to shudder or it seems to show a interventricular septal bounce and also additionally because of this thickened pericardium the underlying myocardium looks to be restrained. Short axis views of the LV are shown here wherein you can see that this is the level of the mitral valve there is again the typical shuddering of the interventricular septum. This is the LV and this crescent shape is the right ventricle. So shuddering of the septum at this level and if you go down below it, this is the papillary level, uh, papillary muscle level. Again, the septum is showing shuddering and also at the apex, which is below the papillary, papillary muscle level, there is shuddering of the septum. Another point is that if you look at the lateral wall of the left ventricle, it looks to be relatively hypokinetic in comparison with the other segments. Hence, one of the prior echo reports which was uh, done outside by this patient did mention that there was LV lateral wall hypokinesia. So this is not real hypokinesia because you can see that the endocardium is moving inside, it is contracting and it is showing systolic thickening, but its movement seems to be restricted because of this thickened pericardium, which is not causing it or not allowing it to move as freely as before. 
let me just bring forth a little differentiation between what is known as interventricular septal shift and interventricular septal shudder or bounce which we just saw. So, in addition to the, the cine clips that I showed of that patient, this patient also demonstrated this particular phenomenon which is the evidence of ventricular interdependence or septal shift. So, what that means is what I have already mentioned in my pri prior videos is with inspiration the septum shifts to the left, here you can see it is moving towards the LV and with expiration the septum shifts to the right that is towards the right ventricle. So, this is because of ventricular interdependence which is classically seen in cases of constriction. This ventricular septal shift can also be demonstrated on M mode echocardiography in which you put a line across one point uh, across the left ventricle and then you get to see various events over time. So, with inspiration we have already seen that the septum, this is the septum, this is the LV cavity, this is the interventricular septum and this is the RV cavity, right. So, with inspiration this septum is moving towards LV. And with expiration, this septum overall is going away from LV towards RV. So, towards RV, towards LV and again towards RV with expiration, inspiration and again expiration. This is ventricular septal shift. In contrast to the ventricular septal shift, which is essentially the response of the septum to the various phases of respiration, a ventricular septal shudder or a septal bounce is seen more easily with the naked eye when you look at the various cine images of the ventricular septum. So, what is a septal shudder? It is a beat to beat diastolic septal motion which occurs irrespective of the phase of respiration. Essentially, it is because of enhanced ventricular interaction which occurs on a millisecond scale. This occurs because of subtle differences in the timing of the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve opening and the subsequent RA and LA contraction. So, here you can see that during diastole, how do you make out what is the phase of diastole is this is the mitral valve, this is the AML and this is the PML not seen very clearly, but this is the diastolic phase and this is the systolic phase where both the walls of the LV are coming together. So, during each diastolic phase you can see there is a little bit of shudder over here or over here or in this phase over here. So, this is what is meant by septal shudder which occurs irrespective of the respiratory phase. Of course, this is less specific, it can also be seen in cases of restrictive cardiomyopathy as well as severe tricuspid regurgitation. The more specific finding is the ventricle, ventricular septal shift which we saw previously that occurs because of ventricular interdependence. So, moving on, this is the apical four chamber view of the patient wherein all the four chambers of the heart are seen. This is the left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium and right ventricle. Again, the septum is demonstrating evidence of both septal shift as well as the shuddering movement. In addition to all the findings so far, we also note that this patient had some mild amount of pericardial effusion which can be present in some 10 to 15 percentage of patients who present with constrictive pericarditis. It can be a manifestation of effusive constrictive pericarditis which is to say that because of an inflammatory cause there is inflammatory pericardial effusion which is mild sometimes can be more severe and also with the hemodynamic effects which are dominated by constrictive pericarditis. The next finding was the evidence of a dilated inferior vena cava. Here we can see that this is the inferior vena cava which is opening into the right atrium. This is a subcostal view. Additionally, this is the hepatic vein which joins the inferior vena cava near its entry point into the right atrium. And here you can see that the IVC does not collapse in the phases of respiration. Usually it is supposed to collapse or become smaller in size with inspiration and then go back to its size during expiration. So, the collapsibility is lost which means that the mean RA pressure of this patient is increased and that is reflected upon in the inferior vena cava.
Now we come to the hemodynamics of constriction and these were the findings we got in our patient. The E upon A ratio was 1.2 which was greater than 0.8 which was the cutoff which we consider when we are trying to rule in or rule out a case of constrictive pericarditis. So what is E wave? E wave is the first wave which occurs during diastole which represents the early diastolic filling from the atrium to the ventricle. And the A wave is the second wave which we see which occurs towards the end of diastole because of atrial contraction. So when you take the ratio, in this case it was 1.2. Additionally, this patient demonstrated evidence of ventricular interdependence in the form of change in the mitral as well as tricuspid inflow velocities with the different phases of respiration. So if you look here, this is the inspiratory phase and this is the expiratory phase. With inspiration, the mitral velocity dropped. With expiration, it increased. With inspiration, it dropped again. With e expiration, it increased. Similarly, on the right hand side, there were certain changes but in the opposite direction. For example, with inspiration, the tricuspid velocities increased. With expiration, it dropped. Again, with inspiration, there was a rise in the tricuspid velocity and with expiration, it dropped. So this is what we've already studied in the first part of the video series on constriction and this was demonstrated in this patient. So how do you calculate the difference or the percentage change? You calculate it for example on the mitral flow side, the percent change in mitral flow is equal to the first expiratory beat velocity because the expiratory beat velocity is going to be greater than the inspiratory beat velocity. So you take the first expiratory beat velocity minus the inspiratory beat velocity divided by the first expiratory beat velocity into 100 to tell you how much percentage change of mitral flow has occurred. If it is more than 25% or if the percent change in tricuspid flow is more than 40% then you have to suspect evidence of constrictive pericarditis. One important point is in what conditions of chronic constrictive pericarditis is respiratory inflow variation not seen. Number one in severe hypervolumia you can not get this respiratory variation because there is so much of excess preload that this variation in res response to respiration is just not seen. So how do you unmask it is you do it by preload reduction for example head up tilt or sitting. Another condition is atrial fibrillation is when there is a short RR cycle there is an increase in the mitral valve velocity on expiration instead of a decrease in mitral valve velocity on expiration which occurs paradoxically. So these points have to be considered when you do not get respiratory inflow variation even if chronic constrictive pericarditis is in fact present. Now we come to tissue Doppler imaging or TDI in which we see the tissue level velocities of the myocardium. So what is seen typically in chronic constrictive pericarditis is that the medial annulus of the mitral valve has an E prime velocity which is quite preserved. In fact it is not just preserved it is more than 8 to 9 centimeters per second. What does this mean? Essentially it is because we know that the lateral aspect of the ventricle and the annulus is tethered and restricted in its motion because of this thickened and calcific pericardium. As a result, the lateral annulus of the mitral valve will not have good velocities during diastole, that means it will not relax very well during diastole, but the medial annulus of the mitral valve will have preserved velocities. That is E prime and A prime are preserved but the most important one is the E prime velocity which will be more than 8, to 8 or 9 centimeters per second. So what is annulus reverses? The same thing that I just said that is tethering of the lateral myocardium by the diseased pericardium leads to an increase in the medial E prime velocity as compared to the lateral annular E prime velocity.
in normal people the lateral e prime velocity is always greater than the medial e prime velocity but in constriction the medial e prime either becomes equal to the lateral or greater than the lateral usually more than 9 centimeters per second after annulus reverses then what is the concept of annulus paradoxes so what it means is even when the e prime velocity is preserved or accentuated then the e by e prime velocity ratio that is we divide the capital e which is the mitral inflow velocity which we just previously saw we divide that velocity by this e prime velocity and you get a ratio essentially this e by e prime velocity ratio is very important to tell you about the pressures in the atrium so for example on the mitral side or the left uh, left ventricular side during diastole this e by e prime velocity if it is increased then it tells you that the left atrial filling pressure is very high during diastole so the la diastolic pressures are high but in cases of constriction this e prime velocity is very much increased mainly contributed by this medial e prime as a result this ratio of e capital e upon e prime is less or lower than expected however even if this number is low numerically you get a low e by e prime velocity ratio realistically the pressure in the la or the pressure in the ra or essentially all the diastolic pressures in all the four chambers are increased because of this constrictive pericarditis which means that there is a raised filling pressure in that atrium either in the left atrium or in the right atrium so this is a paradox despite this velocity ratio being low which means that the la pressure say on the left side is supposed to be is supposed to be low it is not the case because of constriction all the diastolic pressures are risen as high as 20 or 25 millimeters of mercury so they mean that they point to the presence of a raised filling pressure and this e by e prime velocity ratio does not depict this raised pressure so let's see what was found in our patient we took tissue doppler imaging of both the mitral annulus this is the septal or the medial mitral annulus and this is the lateral mitral annulus so a pressure wave doppler was put across it and that's how we got the velocity using tissue doppler imaging so here are the various waveforms this is s prime so this is a systolic event see if you uh, look at the electrocardiogram this is the qrs complex and it is just after that so this entire thing is systolic event after that is the diastolic event which is below the baseline so this is the e prime wave which i talked about and this is the septal or the medial e prime wave which is the most important and this is the a prime wave these are similar waves to what we see in the inflow velocities of capital e and capital a so let's see what the septal e prime was it was around 13.6 centimeters per second so it was more than 9 centimeters per second now compared with the septal the lateral mitral annulus e prime was 10.8 centimeters per second so here we have shown that there is annulus reverses where the septal mitral e prime was greater than the lateral mitral e prime velocity next the pulmonary arterial pressure was estimated by using a tricuspid regurgitation jet and in our case the pulmonary artery systolic pressure was 30 millimeters of mercury so we know that to differentiate chronic constrictive pericarditis from restriction the pa pressure plays an important role if it is more than 55 millimeters of mercury that is the peak systolic pressure then it is more towards restrictive cardiomyopathy whereas when the PASP is less than 55 then there is a possibility of chronic constrictive pericarditis provided that all the other hemodynamic findings are also seen now let's come to what the findings are in a hepatic vein doppler 
Now, a hepatic vein is seen clearly in the subcostal view as I showed previously when I showed you the IVC and it is easier to use the hepatic vein for getting a Doppler profile instead of the IVC because the IVC is horizontal and the hepatic vein is vertical and it joins in a perpendicular manner to the inferior vena cava. And remember when you take a pulse wave Doppler or any Doppler for that matter, you have to have the line which is parallel to the flow in order to get the best measurement of the different flow waves. So, a hepatic vein Doppler is usually used and remember when you put the Doppler probe, this is the point where the Doppler probe is present and the hepatic vein is here vertically and the blood flow in the hepatic vein is away from the probe into the IVC and then both of them drain into the right atrium somewhere here and the heart is here. So, what happens in the hepatic vein during normal phases of inspiration and expiration and during normal phases of the cardiac cycle. So, this is what we get three waveforms S, D and AR. S represents systole, D represents early diastole and AR is atrial reversal because of atrial kick. Now, during systole when the right ventricle contracts, it brings about atrial relaxation. So, the pressure in the atrium falls. In addition, the annulus of the tricuspid valve goes towards the apex of the right ventricle. So, all these events serve to suck in more blood from the hepatic vein and IVC and generally because the blood flow is away from this probe over here, it will demonstrate negative waveform during systole that is a waveform which is below the baseline. Then comes the diastole that is the early part of diastole which represents early diastolic filling. Now this early diastolic filling is again robust and it fills easily from the right atrium to the right ventricle through the open tricuspid valve. Again the blood flow is away from the probe and hence what we get in the hepatic vein Doppler is another negative wave. During the end stage of diastole when atrial kick occurs then some amount of pressure is mounted in the right atrium and that positive pressure relatively positive pressure goes and hits the hepatic vein in such a way that it mounts a positive pressure above the baseline so you get a positive waveform called the A reversal. Now these findings are seen similarly both in inspiration as well as expiration in normal people. Now what happens in constrictive pericarditis, chronic constrictive pericarditis is during inspiration there is increased flow across the tricuspid valve because the septum has shifted towards the left ventricle. As a result its waveforms of S, D and A reversal are the same as what is seen in normal people. However, during expiration the septum shifts towards the right ventricle and the flow across the tricuspid valve is halted. It is not allowed to occur as easily when it, as when it occurs during inspiration. As a result, there is decapitation of both the S and D waves. So here you can see that the S and D waves are smaller and in addition there is reversal of the systolic wave leading to this wave waveform called the systolic reversal, a reversal of the diastolic waveform which is in fact the atrial reversal waveform. So this is what is seen on expiration in chronic constrictive pericarditis. On the other hand, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, because the compliance of the right ventricle is so low, what happens is the right atrium mounts a very high pressure over time in, in the right atrium in order to lead to good filling during the early part of diastole. So the diastolic filling pressure of the right atrium is high and as a result the D wave now predominates and it is bigger than the S wave. If the RV systolic function is intact then the S wave does not decrease too much but the D wave becomes very prominent because the compliance of the right ventricle has decreased and that leads to an increased right atrial pressure and hence with higher right atrial pressure filling occurs in the right ventricle. 
as a result this d wave becomes very very prominent and s is less than d in both the phases of inspiration as well as expiration so when we look at this doppler tracing that we got in our patient on inspiration these were the three waveforms sd and a reversal sd a reversal sd a reversal and on expiration both the s and d waves were smaller as compared to during inspiration and there was a significant a reversal waveform and in addition there was a systolic reversal waveform as well now the superior vena cable flow is an important flow to study and understand especially when you want to differentiate cases of chronic constrictive pericarditis from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or known also known as copd now what happens in copd is that when the patient especially is in respiratory distress there is a large swing of blood volume inside the heart during inspiration and expiration because both the phases of respiration are very deep there is deep inspiration and deep expiration so this affects blood volume to such a large extent that there is a respiratory variation of both mitral and tricuspid inflow velocities just like what is seen in chronic constrictive pericarditis similarly it can also affect the ventricular systolic pressures and lead to discordancy of the right ventricular and left ventricular systolic pressures during inspiration and expiration just like how it is seen in chronic constrictive pericarditis similar to chronic constrictive pericarditis it will show reversal of flow in hepatic vein or ivc doppler on expiration which we just saw so how do you differentiate when you are suspecting a case of constriction from a case of copd when such when such findings do not help you in differentiating these two disease entities so you look at the superior vena cable flow as we've seen in the first part of the video series on constriction we know that the svc flow does not increase with inspiration in chronic constrictive pericarditis and as a result in fact the overall svc pressure rises with inspiration and this leads to what is known as kussmaul sign on the other hand in copd there is florid increase in flow in the svc on inspiration and this is how we differentiate the two entities so in our patient what happened is during expiration this is the flow this is again a subcostal view and the lower part is the superior vena cava here you can make out the liver and this is the inferior vena cava and this is in fact opposite to it the superior vena cava so when a pulse wave doppler which was put across this superior vena cava this was the flow during expiration where there was increased flow and during inspiration the flow decreased now we come to the pulmonary vein velocity doppler which is sometimes done in cases of constriction to see the changes in the waveforms on inspiration and expiration these are the waveforms which are seen normally this is the s wave which represents systole the d wave and the atrial reversal quite similar to what is seen in the hepatic vein doppler except that now these waveforms are above the baseline essentially just meaning that the flow occurs towards the probe towards the direction of the probe of the echocardiography machine so if we see the normal patient it does not show any variation in the flow velocities on inspiration and expiration however in cases of chronic constrictive pericarditis we know that on inspiration the left sided velocities decrease hence the pulmonary vein velocity decreases on inspiration and rises on expiration this change in velocities on the two phases of inspiration and expiration are not seen in normal people and neither are they seen in cases of restrictive cardiomyopathy now what happens in rcm is that the s wave is much smaller as compared to the d d wave which is to say that the d wave is quite significantly increased because the left atrial pressure is increased in response to the loss of compliance that you see in restrictive cardiomyopathy so the early diastolic filling occurs at a very high la pressure and it occurs quickly it occurs very fast and under high pressure so that is how we get a very prominent early diastolic waveform
and these waveforms do not change with inspiration or expiration. Finally, coming to strain imaging, which is a step further ahead after all the hemodynamic features that we've seen on echocardiography, the global longitudinal strain in constriction is preserved and there can be reduction in lateral velocities which was seen in our patient. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, the global longitudinal strain is reduced significantly and there is no regional heterogeneity which is seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy which can be seen in cases of constrictive pericarditis. So is there an algorithm which will help us practically, clinically to approach a case of suspected constrictive pericarditis? So I've taken this algorithmic approach from this particular paper on constrictive pericarditis, a curable diastolic heart failure. And what it says is, if you get mitral inflow capital E by A ratio of more than 0.8, along with the presence of a dilated inferior vena cava, then you have to consider that there can be a possibility of constriction. Then you look at the ventricular septal motion abnormality with respiration, that is the ventricular septal shift which occurs with inspiration and expiration, that is the septum shifts towards the LV on inspiration and shifts back towards the RV on expiration. If it is present, then you look at the medial mitral E prime velocity. If it is more than 8 centimeters per second, then it is most likely to be constrictive pericarditis and you look for other features like annulus reversus where the medial E prime is greater than the lateral E, e prime velocity. So it is most likely constriction. Additionally, if you get the abnormality which we discussed in the hepatic vein, then it is definite constriction. Here they have specifically mentioned the hepatic vein expiratory end diastolic reversal velocity that is whatever velocities are reversing and going above the baseline divided by the forward flow velocity. If that ratio is more than 0.8, then it is constriction. So what it's trying to point out is that there is more of reversal during expiration, which is what we saw. So if this is present, then it's definite constriction. If the mitral medial E prime or the septal E prime velocity is less than 6 centimeters per second, then we know that there's a compliance issue and there is evidence of restrictive cardiomyopathy. If you get intermediate values of between 6 to 8 centimeters per second, it could be a mixed case of mixed constriction and restriction during which you again look at the lateral E prime and if there is annulus reverses, then it is more likely to be constriction than restriction. Now, if you do not get a ventricular septal motion abnormality with respiration, even though you do get a dilated IVC and an increased mitral inflow, then you can consider that it could either be a restrictive cardiomyopathy or it, even if you're still suspecting that constriction is possible based on the clinical presentation and history, then you can go for further imaging or a cardiac catheterization if you still are considering constriction. So is that all? Not really. Despite having three video series on constrictive pericarditis and despite a prolonged echocardiographic evaluation of constrictive pericarditis, in reality, it may not be very easy to prove a case of constrictive pericarditis. If the suspicion is high, it is always good to resort to further imaging modalities like CT, MRI or a cardiac cath to see if it is really constrictive pericarditis. And why do we do all of this? We do it because if it is really constriction, then pericardiectomy would be life-saving. Now, usually cases of chronic constrictive pericarditis come to the clinical, to the clinics or to the emergency room with right-sided heart failure symptoms. Our patient did not demonstrate this, which was an anomaly. Usually they come with pedal edema, abdominal swelling, raised JVP, and all those kinds of typical features. Our patient did have a raised JVP with very deep X and Y waves, but his main complaint was that of dyspnea on exertion. Whenever you get a patient with right heart failure symptoms, 
then it is always worthwhile to rule out constriction. What happened to our patient was that he was found to have tuberculous constrictive pericarditis for which anti-tuberculosis treatment was started along with steroids and a few weeks later pericardiectomy was done. Since then he has been doing well and is asymptomatic. Like always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon and I will see you next time with another video.